Welcome to this tutorial on the conversion of raster geodata to vector geodata and vice versa, meaning the rasterization of vector shapefiles or vector data. In this tutorial I will assume that you know the differences between what are shapefiles or geospatial vector data and geospatial raster data. I will also assume that you have a basic understanding of the handling of gridded raster data and shapefiles in Python. To refresh your mind you can just click here on these links where you will find the tutorial on shapefile, meaning vector data handling, and raster data handling in the ebook. I will also use here again the Fluss Tools environment for importing and working with the open source geospatial library GDAL or OSGeo that I will import here like this. So from OSGeo import GDAL will import the required functions for working with raster data. Um, the import here of OGR will serve us for working with shapefile data and OSR for spatial references. If you want to get uh, to refresh also your installation of Fluss environment and get the um, these geospatial libraries running in your Jupyter kernel, uh, please uh, have a look again here at the Python installation instructions. If you're working on Windows, you can just click here on the Conda environment uh, part. You find the quick guide and also how you can then create an IPython kernel um, that will know your environment or will work in your um, uh, environment that knows then GDAL and OSGeo. To use that library, then recall here you can click here on the kernel menu. You click here then on change kernel and select the kernel you want. So I'm going to work here with the Fluss kernel. Now to get started, let's just import the GDAL, OSR and OGR libraries. To import them, just run that code block here and your kernel will now know the libraries. For the vectorization of a raster data to align, I will use here the least cost path, path from the raster tutorial. So you can either reread here and redo the raster um, tutorial or you can just download the least cost path by clicking on that link. If you downloaded or clone the repository of this course, you will find the least cost path here in your geodata and rasters uh, directory where you have here the least cost uh, dot geotiff. In these uh, tutorials on rasters, I was creating a function called coords to offset that enabled me to draw a line of pixels from one point to another. So that was, if you recall, the cost, the least cost for a fish to swim from one position to another when it needed to escape uh, um, a pitfall from uh, discharge changes. So now in this example, I'm going to use the opposite where I'm converting now an offset to coordinates. So the offsets are just number of pixels and for my shape file, I will need coordinates. This function here accepts one geotransformation object, one offset in x direction and one offset in y direction. It will retrieve the origin and the pixel dimensions from the geotransformation object. So that is osgeo.gdal.dataset.get geotransform that will um, provide you with these um, geotransform object that you need here in this function. If you're not sure anymore uh, exactly what this geotransformation was about, please 
have a look again at the tutorial on shapefiles. Now in this function I'm retrieving the x origin from this geotransform tuple. Recall six elements has these tuples. The y origin from position 3 in this tuple. The, the pixel width is um, at position 1 and the pixel height at the last position of this tuple. Now I'm calculating the x and y coordinates as a function of the x origin and y origin and the pixel width and the pixel height. Now with this information where I have now the pixel numbers converted to coordinates, I can then create a new function that I will call raster to line. What this raster to line function will do is it will take a certain pixel value that I want to connect along the raster. So let's consider here in our discourse path, I had created pixels with um, values of 1. So I want to connect here all pixels that have a value of 1. Just recall here how that discourse path looked like. You find that here at the bottom of the uh, raster tutorial, here we had point 0.1, point 0.2 and that here was our line of pixels with 1 values. So then I will calculate here the maximum distances here as uh, the square root of um, delta x to the square. So 2 times the square root of delta x to the square. And just recall that this can only work if delta y and delta x are the same. So the pixel width and the pixel height are the same in this function. You can also extend this function a little bit and then adapt it toward different pixel width and pixel height. I will now go a little bit down here and directly to the raster to line function and walk you through the raster to line function. If you prefer reading a workflow, then just stay up here and read the bullet points. So the, this raster to line function will take a raster file name, then an output shape, uh, shape file name, so fn here is abbreviated for Shape file, a shape file name and then the pixel value, so the values of the pixels that we want to connect. What I will do here at first is I will um, retrieve the raster array and geotransform objects from the raster to array function that, uh, with the raster file name that I want to convert. So that raster to array function is something that I introduced also with the raster tutorial. So that is what you find here at the raster to grid. And here you first find the open raster function. And then if you scroll a little bit down, you will find the raster to array uh, function. Here it is. You can get the raster to array function also from uh, Fluss tools. The same is here for the raster to line function. If you want to get this or import them just from Fluss tools, um, you can just do that here by typing from Fluss tools tools um, import uh, then uh, the uh, raster to array function or the raster to line function. So you can just write your raster to array, run that code block, and it will now import from Fluss tools the raster to array function. So now it is available to our kernel. Let's go back to our workflow. So now we have the raster as an object, the array data as an object, and the geotransformation as an object. I will retrieve now the pixel width from the geotransformation object. So that is this six um, elements tuple. Now I will calculate the maximum distance between pixels that I want to connect. So that requires that my pixels are always neighbors. And then I want to extract the pixels with a user defined pixel value from the raster array. So here I'm extracting the trajectory as if, uh, with um, the usage of NumPy. So that is np.where. And here I'm looking just in the array where the array has the pixel value. Now, 
what I'm doing here is just a check if the pixel value or that tra trajectory really exists in the raster. So this one here will only be activated if the trajectory is zero. So there's, um, uh, that means I have a non-defined pixel value. Now I want to convert the offset of the coordinates and append it to a nested list of points. So I will in, uh, instantiate here a list of points, a count value, uh, object here, so that is just zero. And then I will iterate here on the elements of the trajectory. So I start here with an offset in y direction in trajectory, then I will here get the offset in x direction, and then count uh, along the trajectory elements. Now I will append the points here to my points list. And what I'm using here is now the offset to coordinates function that I'm providing here with the geotransformation of the raster and the uh, x and y offsets. So that is the function that I was using here. So if you did not run this code block here, make sure to run it have it run now because otherwise this function will not be able to work. What you will also need then is here to import uh, numpy as np if you do not have that in your standard imports anyway. Good, then here I'm just counting upwards until I ran through the whole trajectory. So now I will have the points in a list and I want to convert them to a multi-line string. And the way I'm doing that here is I'm creating a multi-line uh, object and that is a geometry of the OGR library and I will instantiate it as a WKB, so well-known binary multi-line string. And now I am iterating here on the combinations of points. So I will go here on point one and instantiate it here as a geometry point. Add the point here at zero, zero and zero, one. So this here is not referring to absolute coordinates or pixel numbers. It is referring to the combinations here of points. And then I'm adding here a second point. Now, if the distance between the point one and point two is smaller than the maximum allowed distance, I will add this trajectory between point one and point two to my line object. So here I'm just using again here these two points. So that's meaning that means then point one and point two and add it here to my multi line. So now I have my multi line object created and filled with the points that I want to have it in here. And what I will do now is I will use the create shapefile function that we um, elaborated with the shapefile tutorial. It requires an output shapefile name. It, it requires also a layer name. I will just call it here raster PTS and it requires a layer type. So the layer type here is obviously a line because we want to create a line shapefile. Now I'm retrieving here the layer in which I want to work. I need to get again the feature definitions. Now I need to create that new line feature. So just um, recall now here that the shapefile has features and we want to add now that multi-line feature to the shapefile. And that is what we do here in these lines. So now we add, uh, set here the geometry by add, um, by providing it here the multi-line object and we create now this new feature in the shapefile layer. So what is now still missing is the spatial reference system. What I will do here, I will use the get spatial reference system function from the raster. That is again a function that we elaborated with the um, raster tutorial. So you can either now run again the raster tutorial or functions 
to have them in your kernel or you import these functions from uh, Fluss Tools. Just recall now all functions that we had in here were now the so the raster to line function is what we uh, just created. We have raster to uh, array. Then we have the create shapefile function. So that is that one here. And we need the get SRS spatial reference system function. So that is what we get with that here. So you can run this code block if you write them, uh, if you write these commands here, and this will then enable you to run this function here. Another function that is still now missing is the make projection function. So what is the make projection function? That was the thing that added a projection file to our shapefile. So the .prj file. So if we could successfully create now the shapefile with a multi-line object that has been created with a relevant user value, then I can just write now here, success, we wrote the output shapefile name. So I will run now this code block here to get the plus tools function. Then I will run here the raster to line function so that my uh, kernel knows now the raster to line function. Again, you can also import it just from Fluss tools. Then you won't need to write that here. And then here I will just now apply that function. So I will define here a source raster file name, which is the least cost path that you can either download or just you have it from uh, the uh, raster tutorial still. Then I will define a target shape file name. I will call it here now least cost .shp. I will define here the pixel value that I want to use for um, building the line. And then I'm using here now the raster to line function with the source raster file name, the target shape file name, and the pixel value that I want to link. So before I can run now this cell, there are probably two more things that you will need to do um, similar as I will need to do because I do not have here the OS library as a standard import in my Jupyter lab. So I will need to import OS. And in addition, this function here also uses iter tools. So I will also need to import iter tools. Just if you recall the section on code styling, recall that this here is not um, a very good recommendation for importing libraries. Anyway, this is what I'm doing now. It just is a quick fix to run this little code block. So now I can click here on the run button and it will write now here my shapefile least cost. That will live now here depending on your local structure in the geodata folder. So here in the shapefiles folder, you should find now the least cost um, shapefile. So here it is in my case. Um, it might be somewhere else as a function of what you define here. And again, if you are uh, opening this shapefile now in QJS, it should look like this. And I still have another little challenge here for you. You see that there is a little mistake in this shape file and there would be a bug fix required for coming over this uh, little mistake. Just here uh, as a little um, hint, that mistake is in this triangle and it's because of the maximum distance that I was using. So I wish you uh, much fun with developing here a solution for that. Now if we want to convert a raster to a vector data set that is 
at least in my experience, mostly rather a polygon that we want to create than a line. While lines can also be useful, in particular this raster to line function, if we want to uh, create uh, multiple lines as contour lines, for example. Let's have now a look um, how we can create a raster to a polygon. GDAL has one very powerful function that is the polygonize function. This polygonize function can also be called through terminal and I will come back later to how you can do that. But what also the terminal call and this GDAL.polygonize function have in common is that they need an integer raster as input. So the first thing that we need to do when we want to convert a raster to polygons is to convert the raster to an integer raster. Most rasters that we are using, at least in the context of water resources, meaning something like the fraud number, the water depth, or the flow velocity, those are in float values. So to convert now a raster or a float raster to, um, to integer values, I wrote that little function here that is then again also available in FlussTools. What this function does, it will again use here the raster to array function, as you have seen in the last section. It will use a raster file name and a band number, which is the band number that you would provide here to the float to end function. Now it would convert that array of the function uh, of that raster to an integer. This operation here will work if all pixels of the array are either float or already integer values, so something numeric. If it cannot perform that operation, it will return here an error. Now I will also need again the spatial reference system because I will need to recreate a new raster. And the way how that function does it here, it will take the fi raster file name of the provided raster and we'll just append here an underscore int and recreate then a geotiff. For creating a geotiff, I will uh, reuse here the create raster function from the raster tutorial. So you see now again, I am using a lot of functions that stem from the former tutorials on rasters and partially shape files. Now you can either run again the Jupyter Notebooks for that, as you've seen before, or you write just again from flusstools.geotools and then import the functions that are missing. Or in this case, um, you can also use a wildcard import so with, by just writing here a star. And you can do that because we wrote flusstools in a way that it will not overwrite typical um, Python system variables. So you can just run that code block now and now um, you will have available uh, also the create raster function from before and in part also already here the, that flow to int uh, function. So you do not really need to run this code block here anymore because it is already loaded through Fluss tools. I run it here anyway. Just one more hint here for the raster creation here. I'm using now the GDT underscore int 32 data type so that my raster is really an integer data type. Now I have everything that I need to write a raster to polygon function. So again, here you can um, stay up here and read just the workflow or follow the workflow that I wrote here as bullet points or you follow me now here down to the raster to polygon function that takes a file name of the raster that I want to convert, then an output shape file name and the band number of their input raster that I want to convert, which is at least for me, mostly just band number one, which is why I uh, coded that here as the default value. And then the field name that should contain the values of the raster that are converted. These parameters here are again explained in the doc strings of that function. 
This function here will first call the float to integer function to make sure that the raster is an integer. Then it will open this integer raster and retrieve the raster band and the raster dataset object. Now it will create a new shapefile name with the create shape function that is also in Fluss tools or from the shapefile tutorial. That function, just here to refresh your mind, needs then output shapefile name. So that can be anything that you want to provide here to the function. And it will then use here a layer name. You may want to flexibilize the function and also add that here as an option keyword argument for the raster to polygon function. Then it will use here a layer type and that is polygon and that's probably nothing that you want to flexibilize because if you want to convert a raster to a polygon then the layer type should be polygon. Now I create here destination layer and the way I'm doing that I'm using here the newly created shapefile object and I'm instantiating here a get layer object. Now I'm creating a new field to define the values so the values here should be an OGR uh, integer type because the raster values are integer. So that is here the field definition and now I am creating this new field in the destination layer. Now I can run the polygonization through gdal.polygonize. I need to provide it with a raster band. I could also add here an H mask band. So I listed here these options also in the itemized workflow up here. Then I am providing here destination layer. The zero here um, refers to a field ID. This here are then some more functions, uh, sorry, um, option keyword arguments uh, that you can provide to it. And actually these are not so optional, otherwise uh, I would not need to uh, write them in here. So these are arguments that you can uh, provide to the function and then after the polygonization so now I have the raster polygonized um, it created here the destination layer I will again need to create a projection file otherwise QGIS or any other uh, desktop GIS um, software will not know how to place the raster this is again the standard pro procedure of adding a spatial reference system and making the projection file. If the whole function ran successfully, it will then print here that success message again. So before I uh, mention that I will just, uh, that I will come back here to the option that you can run GDAL polygonize here through the terminal or Anaconda prompt, um, you can find more instructions here by clicking on uh, that uh, link. How, so that's more instructions on how you would um, run these uh, commands in terminal. And again here the hint that you can find the flow to in function and the raster to polygon function also in Fluss tools. To see these functions implemented in Fluss tools, you can either go again to the documentation at flusstools.readthedocs.io or you click here on that link to see the geotools.by script in Fluss tools. Okay, now let's run an example. In this example, I will again use here the OS library. So if you did not import it yet, you will probably need to do so. I will also use here that H001000 uh, GeoTIFF from the River Architect sample datasets. That is something that I made uh, reference to the first time in the raster uh, dataset handling and tutorial at the very beginning. So there are the instructions how you can get this data set. Then I am defining here a target shapefile name. So that's here in shapefiles. And I will just call it um, H for water depth um, polygon classes. Now I'm running here then my raster to polygon function with just the source raster name and the target shapefile name. That means I will keep all defaults here for the band, num uh, band number and the field name. So I run this function now and here this is now the result. 
So I didn't run here the raster to polygon con code block before, and that is why um, now th this code block used my wildcard imported um, raster to polygon function from Fluss Tools. Now that you run successfully that code block, you will find the integer value raster or the water depth in the raster subfolder that is somewhere over here in the geodata raster subfolder, depending on what you defined here in the first line. So that is here in my case, and you will find the h poly uh, underscore CLS, so the um, classified polygons here in the shapefile subfolder also depending on what you defined here. So it has again here a projection file that we created with the make projection function. If you pull that polygon now up here in QJS, it will look something like that where you will find integer values now of the water depth. We can also convert now a shapefile back to a raster. This process is called rasterize and you will find rasterize functions from GDAL either in the, its Python bindings or in its terminal functions too. What I will write here in the following is a rasterize function using GDAL and you can now again just either follow here that itemized workflow or you follow me here to the rasterize function that is basically an implementation of this workflow. So this rasterize function is again available through Fluss Tools. So with the wildcard import of Fluss Tools, it's also already here in my kernel or um, you can overwrite that import here by running then this code block. The function will take an input shapefile name so that should be a shapefile that already exists, whatever it is, if it's a polygon or a line or whatever. Then it will take a raster file that we want to create and a default pixel size of 10. Now, what are these 10? Well, that depends on what the spatial reference system of your input shapefile name is because this function here is gonna use the input shapefiles spatial reference system to create the output raster. So if the input spatial uh, reference system uses degrees for creating pixel sizes, then you're working here with degrees and these 10 would be incredibly big. If it is in meters, then it would be 10 meters. If it is in US customary, it would create something like 10 uh, foot or 10 feet big pixels. The function uses a default no data value, so the value that it will be assigned to pixels where no um, feature of the shape file touches a pixel, um, and they will use here by default minus 9999. Um, that is also in line with what I was using in the raster tutorial. As a default data type, I use a float value here, a GDT float 32. And then there are a bunch of keyword arguments, optional keyword arguments that you can use for the GDAL rasterization function. And I will come back to those in a couple of minutes. So before you run that function, um, just um, go through to, to the end here and explore the keyword arguments here that can have a pretty important uh, effect on your output. So the very first step in this function here is of course to open the shapefile. The way how I'm doing that here is through the OGR library dot open so everything you know already from the shapefile tutorial. Now I have here my source data set and if that didn't work because the shapefile didn't exist or it couldn't open it for any other reason, then we'll already return here a runtime error. Otherwise, it will continue here and open the source layer as a G, uh, dot get uh, layer uh, object. Then I will read here the extent of the source layer. So what are the maximum extents of 
the features in my vector data set. And then I will calculate the x and y resolution as a function of the pixel size. So the x resolution and um, similar here then the y resolution will be integer values of the x min and y x, uh, sorry, x max and x min uh, difference divided by the pixel size and similar then for the y resolution. Now I am creating here the destination data source. By default, I'm creating a GeoTIFF raster and for that purpose, I'm um, activating here the uh, GDAL driver GTIFF and I create here the output raster file name with the X resolution and the Y resolution that I calculated from the pixel uh, size and the extents of the raster. The E type here is the raster data type, so the flow that I want to use. Now I'm assigning here a geo transformation as a function of the minimum x value, the pixel size, and the uh, uh, maximum y value. And here, attention again, that is minus than the pixel size. So that is the geo transform object, which is again this six elements tuple that the raster will use. Now for the um, writing the data, I will need to instantiate here at least one raster band and I will just use here in that function only one raster band. If you want to um, create multiple rasters, for instance, if you want to create a color uh, raster that uses some uh, RGB codes, then you may want to add multiple bands to the raster. I will fill my band here with the no data value by default so that it has some data every, everywhere. And I will then define here this the no data value that um, is either the default or the user defined minus 9099. Now I will assign here the spatial reference system from the source data set and that is what will then drive here again the pixel size and the resolution, what they really mean in terms of units. This here is analogous to what you've seen in the tutorials on rasters and shapefiles so far. Now I will use the rasterize layer function from GDAL that takes here the target dataset name as a first argument, then a list of the bands that I want to uh, want to provide here to the um, new raster. I could also just put here an integer, but I'm, pro I'm, I'm adding here a list to enable an extension of that function, for instance, to RGB, so red, green, blue, and colors. Then the function requires a source layer data set. Then here are some other um, optional keyword arguments that are, for instance, here the PF and PFN transformer and a P transform argument. Um, if you want to learn more about these uh, optional keyword arguments here, I by default use here none. Um, you can just click here on the links in the GDAL docs and read more about it. What's then important again here is the uh, burn values here. That's the values that I will burn here on to uh, the layer. So that's the default value and that is deferred uh, burned to the raster. Um, you can also use here the node da data value or just zero. Now here are the options that you may want to use here for the um, rasterization of the layer. What I'm doing here is I'm using a widely hard-coded um, option here to assign these um, to assign these options. Um, um, here I'm using all touch true, which means that every pixel that is somehow on, only partially touched by one of the um, shapefile features will get that value that the shapefile has there 
um, you can modify that behavior by setting this value here to false. I also use here the attribute option that is already flexibilized in terms of function um, inputs. So if you would get here, uh, if you would um, provide here to the function a field name keyword argument, option keyword argument, then you can define here the attribute that the uh, that that function should write to the raster layer. So for instance, if your shapefile has an attribute table and the attribute table has multiple fields and there's one particular field that you want to write to the uh, target raster, this is what this attribute keyword here will do. So while this here is an option keyword argument in the function, you should better use it because otherwise it will probably not write anything here to the function. So that's not very um, robust coding and I invite you to improve the function um, for your purposes. After running successfully here the rasterize layer function, I will then just release again the raster band cache. Again, you will find that function here also in the Fluss Tools uh, package with uh, some more extended error handling and um, option keyword arguments. So let's put bring this function to use. In this codebook here, I'm uh, signing here a source shapefile. Again, here first with the OS library where I'm retrieving the absolute path where I'm working. And I will use here just the classified um, on these poly water depth polygons that I just created. Then I will run here, uh, I will define here a target raster data set. So I will re-raster now the water depth values. That is not very meaningful, but well. Uh, and now here I'm running here the raster as function with the source shape by name, the target raster uh, name. I'm overriding the default value for the pixel size with five. I'm using here as an RD data type, um, an integer data type because my source data set is already integer and I want to save this space. Um, it doesn't make sense then to use float. So that's what I'm overriding here. And this field name, I'm going to use here the values field, which was the default field name that I created uh, before when I um, created this, uh, these polygons here of water depth. So now I can run this cell here and it will have created then my re-rustered integer raster file. If you pull that up in QJS, it will look something like this. So that is it for the theory. If you want to deepen your knowledge on handling geospatial data with Python, so the creation of a, uh, of a shapefile, working with the raster file and their conversion is and that is all also part here of the geospatial ecohydraulics exercise which is a pretty long exercise um, and i really invite you to do that exercise not only because it is um, and has some fun information on ecohydraulics it is also uh, very useful to familiarize with geospatial python I hope you enjoyed this tutorial and thanks for watching this video.